Welcome. Thank you very much for having me here. I want to tell you a story. And it starts like most good stories. Once upon a time, very, very far away and very long ago, 1.3 billion years ago, there were two black holes orbiting around each other. They actually had been for billions of years. But just in the last couple tenths of a second, as they were losing energy, the gravitational waves, they spun faster and faster and closer and closer until they coalesced into a single black hole, wobbled a little bit, and then went radio silent and gravity wave silent for the rest of eternity. The gravitational waves from that radiated out. Um, that's the story that I'm going to be telling you about today when they got to Earth. So this is a black hole. <laughs> this is a black hole on a white background. Here's a black hole with a couple of labels on it. Um, a black hole is a rip in space-time. It's a place where um, gravity has become so strong that space has collapsed on itself. This can happen, for instance, if you have a star that's burning its nuclear fuel. It runs out of fuel, and that pressure that was there to hold it out disappears, and it collapses down to a mathematical point. All of the mass of that star is concentrated into a point in space. That's our, our singularity. Around that is an event horizon, and this is a distance from the singularity. If you're closer than that, nothing can get out, not even light. Um, and so that is the, the very special um, th kind of object that we detected. Now, it's something that's more familiar to you all folks. This is, uh, uh, this is in fact, not um, Galileo, but someone who looked enough like him, so I chose a nice figure. Um, it it's, was a remarkable thing to point a telescope to the skies for the first time in oh, when it was, it was probably 1610 or something, 1687, 1610, I don't know, somewhere back there. And that was a remarkable thing because it opened a new window on a new kind of science. Uh, he looked up, he saw the moons of Jupiter, that was a first discovery. But almost everything that we've learned from the cosmos since then has been through the medium of electromagnetic astronomy, using photons, using um, optical telescopes, uh, radio telescopes, x-rays, and has been a remarkably wonderful, useful tool. But I want to tell you about a different kind of tool that we're just on the cusp of realizing. I'm going to move forward from 1.3 billion years ago, from 1610, and now all the way up to Exactly 100 years ago, 1916, our fav favorite former patent clerk by the name of Albert Einstein, um, who had been worried about synchronizing clocks and, and trains in Europe, um, had written his theory of general relativity the year before, in 1915. In 1916, he was figuring out what kind of interpretations you could make from it. One of the things that he saw was that if you accelerate two masses, like these two clickers here, if you accelerate two masses, you shake space-time. You can make gravitational waves that propagate out of the speed of light. This was a, quite of a novel idea. Um, his whole conception of gravity was so different from ours, though. Um, Isaac Newton had a theory of gravity, and it's one that we're familiar with. He thought of objects as attracting each other. And he thought of this as being something that left space and time alone. But Einstein's idea was rather different. He said well, that a mass causes space-time to curve. And that is really the thing that we experience in terms of, an, of a gravitation. For this figure here, we take three-dimensional space and collapse it down to just two dimensions. And then we place the sun in it, and we see the sun distorts space-time. It makes a dimple in space-time. And the reason that the Earth orbits is that it's caught in that dimple. It stays at a certain distance from the sun running around in that dimple. And this is something which was first seemed completely outrageous, but Einstein made predictions about what you could measure to prove that this was the case. He said that starlight would be bent around the sun by this effect, because everything experiences the dimple in space-time. And in fact, it was shown to be true. This, I love this uh, snippet from the New York Times. Stars not where they seemed or calculated to be, but nobody need worry. <laughs> but the bottom line was that general relativity looked like it had legs. Let's turn the page in my story Oh, actually, first let's look. This is a simulation. This is showing my two black holes again spinning around. This is a simulation that shows in color format 
the gravitational waves as they're radiating out from this, and they will radiate out at the speed of light as the two um, black holes coalesce and become one. Now, the thing I want to stress from the simulation is the effect on space-time is to shorten and lengthen something that's measuring perpendicular to that wave of, of the gravitational wave. And that's going to be key to our means of detecting them. These are beautiful simulations that were made for our discovery, by the way. Um, and how much energy was given off by our particular event? It was given off by a 29 solar mass and a 36 solar mass black hole spinning around. It was the, the only equation that most people in the room, and probably myself as well, could really repeat by heart from Einstein equals mc squared. If you put in m from three solar masses into that equation, you get the amount of energy out that was emitted. That's equivalent to 50 times the light of all the stars in the universe for a few tenths of a second, or equivalent to a billion, billion, billion years of energy of, of consumption by humans. Um, it was an incredible amount of energy that was given off in gravitational waves. But then how big was the effect here from that? We take these two black holes, these singularities in space-time, where tens of solar masses have been collapsed down to hundreds of kilometers in space, uh, distance from, I don't know, Philadelphia to New York or something like that, um, and you cause them to spin around at the speed of blades in the blender in your kitchen. Um, that event, 1.3 billion light years away, makes it, in effect, incredibly tiny here because space is so stiff. Um, if you had a meter stick, I told you that it, the, the effect of this gravitational wave passing is to change the apparent distance perpendicular to the propagation of the gravitational wave. Let's imagine we take a meter stick. If you look closely, that's a yard stick. I didn't have a meter stick at home to photograph. But at any rate, you'll see that this should change length by a very tiny, small amount. How much? Take that, that meter stick and divide it by a million. That gets you down to about the tenth of a width of a human hair. But then you divide that by a million and then you divide that by a billion, and you find out that that meter stick should change length by 10 to the minus 21 meters as that gravitational wave goes by. That's our measurement challenge. So let's turn the page in our storybook now and move forward to 1967 when a young faculty professor, faculty member at MIT, uh, Ray Weiss, um, was, he's, he's an experimentalist. He's really an instrument builder at heart. And he had the job of teaching general relativity, which is not the kind of thing he likes to do. And he was just keep, keeping a couple of days ahead of his students. And he had to make up a problem set for them. He said, how about if we take these brand new things called lasers and try to use them as some kind of measurement technique for, for detecting gravitational waves as they pass? Turns out all of his students got the problem right. Um, but Ray fell headlong into it. He, just, he, he got fascinated by the idea and started working through all of the detailed problems technologically that need to be solved to build an instrument. What was that kind of technology, uh, the detection technology? Here you see an electroluminescent sea creature. Um, it's supposed to be, in fact, a simulation of a propagating gravitational wave. Imagine the wave traveling from right to left. Um, you see that what it does is to distort space first in one direction while stretching it and then stretching and, and compressing in this direction. So you could see if you could put a measurement device here that could measure the difference between this distance and this distance, you might have a ghost of a chance of detecting this, this kind of signal. So here we cause our sea snake or gravitational wave to fall on the surface of an experimental table. And on this experimental table is an interferometer. How does that interferometer work? We have a laser light which comes into a 50-50 mirror. It's split into two perpendicular arms. The light's reflected off those two arms. It comes back, recombines at that beam splitter, and those two light fields are added together, and they can add constructively or destructively. And if you change the length of the arms a very small amount, it changes that phase, and in the consequence, changes the light intensity that falls on a photodetector here. So this very simple object, a Michelson interferometer, is a transducer for converting gravitational wave strains in space into electrical signals. That was the inspiration that Ray Weiss had, and that's the basis of the instrument that we use to make this detection. 
one of the things that I want to point out here, it's really important, just like a radio antenna for long radio waves, if you make the antenna longer, the signal gets longer in that antenna. The same thing is true for the gravitational waves as we try to detect them. And so it really helps to make a big interferometer. If you make a 10 meter interferometer instead of a one meter interferometer, the signal will go up by a factor of 10 from 10 to the minus 21 to 10 to the minus 20 meters. Still pretty small, but we're going in the right direction. So Ray laid out for us um, in a paper, internal paper he wrote in 1972, what we needed to do to make a practical detector. But there were a bunch of small technical uh, um, steps that needed to be made along the way. And here you see uh, my laboratory back in probably 1981 or two or something like that, where we were making small scale interferometers, one's meters long arms, to try and test out ways of doing things. And you can kind of identify the parts that I just showed you in the, in the toy interferometer. Here's a laser, it was argon ion laser at the time, carried with a light fiber over to some relay mirrors. Here's where that beam splitter is, the 50-50 mirror. It goes down these two arms, comes back again, and falls into a whole bunch of, uh, of, la of <laughs> electronics from the last century. But the remarkable thing is that we were able to bit by bit prove that we had technologies that could work. And as a consequence, we had the courage to tell the National Science Foundation that we thought that we knew what we could do with a large sum of money to make gravitational wave detectors. And this is what we, and that's what you, bought for us. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Two observatories, one in Louisiana, one in Washington State, Instead of having 10 meter long arms, we went for four kilometers. That was the longest we thought our taxpayers would like to afford. Um, there's a vacuum system through which the light travels, and it takes gazillions of scientists, engineers, technicians, and a lot of students to make this thing work. Here you see the control room and people working, many of them students, on trying to get something useful out of the instrument. Um, this was built up by the LIGO Laboratory. It's a combination of MIT and Caltech. Um, we're supported by a large community, um, but we have the responsibility for the observatories. And we built these observatories in the 90s. We put the instruments together in around 2000. We worked on getting them from just barely working to their design sensitivity till about 2005 or so. And by 2011, uh, we um, had observed with these instruments at their full sensitivity. Um, and we were very proud of what we'd done, except that we had seen Nothing. We learned a lot. Um, what kinds of, of lessons did we learn? Uh, we learned how to build and commission these detectors. We learned how to analyze the data. We did actually a lot of interesting upper limits and interesting non-detections. We could tell people, no, that signal did not come from a gravitational wave in that nebula. That's some, sometimes an interesting thing to know. But it was clear that we needed more sensitive detectors. And the NSF was ready for this because we were very clear on that in our original proposal. I want to give you a sense of, of what kinds of advantage you get to making a more sensitive one. We really win with gravitational waves. Our initial detectors could reach out to the Virgo supercluster for neutron star, neutron star binary in spirals, one possible source. We could see out 20 megaparsecs. We had ideas for how we could build something that would be 10 times more sensitive, out to 200 megaparsecs. That factor of 10 greater reach is a wonderful thing because for gravitational waves, we sense the amplitude and the signal falls off as one over r, not one over r squared. So if we can see out a factor of 10 further, we have a 1,000 times more candidates within our reach. So we go from kind of zero or one detection to maybe many detections by making such an improvement in the sensitivity of the detector. So for advanced LIGO, we had better science ideas for the detector. All of these things happened in parallel with building the main observatories. Better technology to realize those ideas, we had the experience of building initial LIGO. We had much better systems engineering and QA. That was really important. Um, we had 15 years of the scientific life of something like 100 of the best instrument scientists on the planet really completely dedicated themselves to making this the instrument that would do the trick. And then we had the incre incredible courage, vision, and patience on the part of the NSF and then also from the taxpayers. Again, thank you very much. So we took out um, initial LIGO. And we installed advanced LIGO, um, new laser systems, new optic systems, new computer systems that do all the controls and so forth and so on. And then by March of 2015, we had two detectors installed, one in Louisiana, one in Washington, and we started the tuning process. This was the process that took five years in initial LIGO to get from just barely locking to the point where we had a good sensitivity. 
In advanced LIGO, we're astonished and pleased, delighted to see it took five months instead to get to the point where we could say it looks like an, an observing run somewhere in mid-September of 2015 would probably be worthwhile to shake the instrument down and see if it might do something interesting. So this is where the story starts to come together in an exciting way. 1.3 billion years after the black holes merged, which is interestingly about the same time that single cell animals were starting to join into multi-cell animals on the Earth. 100 years after Einstein predicted gravitational waves, 50 years after Ray Weiss invented this technique for us, 20 years after the NSF, MIT, and Caltech built the initial LIGO, 10 years after advanced LIGO got the okay, six months after starting detector tuning, and only two days after we turned the instruments on, we got very lucky. Um, so September 14th, 2015, um, at 5.51 EDT, we had a cosmic rendezvous. This is exactly what happened. That little wiggle of the mirrors took place. And here you see, versus time, the stretching and squeezing of space as the gravitational waves came by. I'm going to spend the rest of my talk eking out some of the information about that and showing you some of the instrumentation that we used to actually make that detection. Here's another really nice simulation of the black holes. And now, I told you the dimples got deeper as the mass of the objects got deeper and deeper. Underneath these black holes are dimples infinitely deep. And we see space-time starting to be curved by the interaction between the two gravitational waves. I don't know if you can see it, but down here at the bottom, there's a time trace that's unfolding that shows how space is being squeezed and stretched as a function of time. The two systems are getting closer and closer together as they lose energy to gravitational radiation. They spin faster and faster and closer and closer. And in fact, once they get close enough so space is really distorted, we're going to slow the movie down so you can see in more detail the way that it gets ripped up in the center of space-time here between the two. And the signal will grow larger and larger as it gets closer and closer to the point where the two are going to coalesce and share the same event boundary. That's the point of maximum gravitational wave signals. Then this black hole wobbles a bit like jello with some very well-defined simple frequencies. The gravitational waves go rippling out, and again, the black hole disappears for all time. And this is actually what happened 1.3 billion years ago. So I'm going to show you one more interesting way of looking at our signal. This is a spectrogram. This is time again, tenths of a second along the horizontal axis. Along this axis is frequency. You notice these frequency, this, that's middle C there. Um, th these are frequencies um, by the design of our instrument and by the masses of the, of, the, of the objects that we're detecting, which are just about in the audio range. They don't actually make sound, but you can take the electrical signal from the photodiode and put it through an amplifier, where we're going to hear it in just an instant, and get a sense of what it sounds like. I understand that that's just an analogy. Um, so I'm going to actually play a bit of sound for you, and what you'll hear is the instrumental background, and three times we repeat to make it easier to hear the sound of those black holes coalescing together when interpreted as, as sound waves. You have to imagine two black holes, 30 solar masses each, spinning around at a speed that makes a sound like that. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. And here was just how right Einstein was. If we take our measured signal, this is that strain versus time, and then we take Einstein's equations from 1916, we use some very modern tools for doing the calculation, but we just calculate what happens if two objects of that mass go spinning around and become one, and we take this um, signal and we subtract it from what we saw, the only noise is remaining. Einstein was dead right. It's just astonishing how his vision at that time, without having any notion that a black hole could exist, was so precisely correct. Um, another important thing to say is that LIGO measures the strain as a function of time. It's like a strip chart recorder for squeezing and stretching of space. Um, it actually measures the dis change in distance between the optics that we put there. And it, for me, it's just an astonishingly tangible connection between this thing that happened 1.3 billion light years ago to objects that we can barely conceive of and things that we build in machine shops. It's a, it's a really wonderful thing to see that intimate connection. So I want to, to give you a little tour of the hardware. Um, we, we were looking at fairly simple interferometers. This one's already more complicated than the one I first told you about. You make an optical layout, it looks like this. You try to tuck it into it, a vacuum system to keep the dust off the mirrors. And then you use CAD CAM programs to figure out how you can get all the parts onto the seismic isolation systems. It's a really complicated systems engineering job. 
And for fun, I've tried to learn a little bit about telescopes. I've tried to pull out of the web some um, ways, some parallels that we have between um, uh, optical astronomy and radio astronomy and my kind of new astronomy. So here is a picture I just love. It's the Hale 200-inch telescope in the process of being built. It looks like a real mess in there. Um, and this is what it looks like when it's all cleaned up and finished. Um, and obviously, there's a telescope tube which serves to separate the primary and the secondary mirrors. I just saw a number of them out in the demonstration hallway there. We also have tubes. Um, they, they serve to separate the, our end test mass, our mirror, from our beam splitter by those two and a half miles or four kilometers. Um, this is one of the two of them. And actually, from here to, to that building, that's two kilometers. That's the mid station. There's another two kilometers of tubing after that. Under that cover there, is the vacuum system that we use because even if a couple of molecules of air pass the laser light beam, it will mask the gravitational wave signal or it can imitate one. And then we do have this concrete cover on the outside, this being the US, you have to size the thickness of that cover to stop the biggest bullet that you think any hunter might use to shoot at it. <laughs> but as it turns out, it's also useful for stopping cars. No troopers were harmed in this experiment. The airbag worked. The seatbelt worked fine, too. Um, it, it, this is out at the Hanford uh, nuclear site where we have one of our two observatories. And they were doing a midnight scramble. And this, this was not on his map. It's, it's, it was sad. Um, inside, right, this is where the beam splitter is. Here's a kind of a mini version of it. This is where the beam splitter is. These are huge vacuum tanks. I don't know if you have a sense of scale. This is about the height of a person or so. And these are the beginning of the two arms going out four kilometers in the two directions. Um, this is another point of contact with you folks, mirrors. We have these mirrors that we use to reflect the light. Um, it requires the state of the art in substrates, in figuring, in polishing, and in coding. And this is a really fascinating thing because it's both the physical test mass, it's the point in space time that has to be able to respond to the passing gravitational wave as well as being, as being part of a really high precision optical system that has to have all the characteristics of the, one of the best mirrors ever made. So it's really hard to do a good job of it. Here's another image of it while it was in the process of being, uh, actually there's some flats being put on it so that we know how to hang it. Um, and here's a measure of how flat it is. We use a special purpose interferometer to measure its flatness. And this is a map of it. Um, this is um, about plus one nanometer to minus one nanometer. A nanometer is lambda over a thousand for us. And the RMS um, surface of it is something like lambda over 10,000 for our wavelength. So our Strel racer, I don't actually know this, um, this term here, but it's pretty darn good compared with the kinds of mirrors that you typically find in a, in a good telescope. Um, and the radius of curvature for us is a couple kilometers as opposed to, I don't know, a small uh, telescope might have a 48. So you can cite similar kinds of numbers, but the numbers are very, very different. Um, this is one of the fun things, the final figuring of that mirror what they do is they put it in that interferometer, they get an image of where the high spots and the low spots are. Where the high spots are, they take it back out and they put it under an ion milling machine and they remove a few atoms. And in that process, get to the design surface. And this is a demonstration that one of our manufacturers did for a 60 by 60 millimeter piece of, of sapphire, this actually was, where they show that with their tools they can dig down uh, by lambda over 100. Um, it's, it's incredibly fine um, precision that can be done. I think the technology was developed to look down on us from space, but um, <laughs> then comes the mirror reflective coating. Um, typical telescopes apparently like to use aluminum mirror coatings where you feel like you're doing pretty well if you've got a 98% reflectivity. Here's a curve of 96, 92% over a very broad wavelength range. We use instead multi-layer dielectric coatings where you pile up a whole bunch of alternating surfaces to get a very narrow band filter characteristic where instead, I only have the transmission here, the, uh, the reflectivity is something like 0.99999 if I said the right number of nines. So it's a very highly reflective mirror and also it absorbs very, very little heat. We'll see a story about that later on. This is what one of those mirrors looks like when it's installed inside our vacuum system. Everything has got to be super clean so you're always in bunny suits. Um, and you can see it, it's sitting in its suspension here. And here's another view of that suspension. To keep the thermal noise down, the Brownian noise at a minimum, this whole bottom part of the suspension is made all completely out of few silica. It's, it's a piece of, uh, it's, it's a jewel made out of glass. The whole thing is a 200,000 carat gem, approximately. 
I want to say a little bit about another parallel that I found between telescopes, um, in, in this case the Hubble, and ours. Um, Hubble, of course, had a problem that it was sent up with a very precisely, but incorrectly, figured mirror, and it was necessary to send up people for a spacewalk to put in compensation plates to bring the focus back again. And that worked very well. We have a similar sort of problem in that we have a lot of light stored in our arms. We have up to about a megawatt of light. And even though the absorption is only a part per million, that still leaves a watt behind in each one of these mirrors. And that makes them bump out. It makes them curve. So what we do is that we add some additional heat in the form of a little ring-shaped heater around the outside. So instead, the whole mirror is hot, and that removes the deformation. And if there should be a hot spot somewhere on the mirror, we also have a CO2 laser that we can shine in there and heat up the rest of the mirror in a complementary way so as to do the same kind of, of refocusing that Hubble had to do with the spacewalk. Ours is adjustable from the ground. <laughs> Baffles. You folks use baffles inside the telescope tubes to, re to reduce the, um, the acceptance of stray light and, and, uh, and flare, I think. Um, we also use baffles. Um, similar sort of story. This is the inside of the four kilometer long tube. And if light scatters out of the main laser beam and scatters back in again, that's a noise source for us. So we have baffles all along the inside here. The thing is that we have them figured with these knife edge um, forms so that it will randomize the light um, scatter. So you imagine the job that these guys have. They crawl down a four kilometer long tube about three feet big in diameter and install these things that are so sharp that they will cut you if you touch them. And if you leave a drop behind of blood in there, we're probably gonna leave you in there and pump the system down. So. <laughs> this is what it looks like if it's out of the vacuum chamber. Um, w one more time on the amplitude versus power sort of thing. Here's a time series from a radio telescope. Um, there's a, a rotating dwarf star, and every time it goes around, a beacon hits the Earth and we receive a small bit of, of radio signal. And so over hours, we see jumps in the, in the power received by the receiver um, each time it goes past. Um, they're measuring the power. This is always a positive number because it's the power that's coming in, I mean, except for the noise which goes down below. LIGO measures the time series of the amplitude, and so it goes plus and minus. We see squeeze and stretch, and that's a very significant difference between our kind of receiver and a typical sort of a radio or optical receiver. So there's a contrast that you can draw between the kinds of things that you see in space with, um, with um, electromagnetic astronomy, photons, if you will, high spatial resolutions, relatively small masses, often it's atoms that are doing the radiating, um, an exterior surface of astronomical objects is usually a thing that you see. It could be masked by intervening manner, matter. It falls off as one of our squares. So that limits how far away you can look. And then there's also scattering from intervening matter. It could be that what you're seeing light here is actually light that came in from the side and then scatters toward you. In the case of gravitational waves, you have very low spatial resolution. We don't know anything about those black holes. In fact, black holes don't have any details, but never mind. It's just a signal wiggle. Um, we have coherent motion of very large masses to make a big enough signal for us to detect. The deep interior of objects is what we see if there's a, a fluffy outside. That doesn't mean anything for gravitational waves. There's no masking. There's a one over R fall off, and there's no scattering. So it's, it, they're complementary but very interesting pieces of information that you can use for understanding what's going on. I mentioned that our two detectors were separated uh, by uh, a few states. In fact, if you go directly from one to the other by um, light, it takes 10 milliseconds, and gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, told us by Einstein. Um, what we saw for our signal was that seven milliseconds was the delay between the two. And you can see, if the signal came out right from on top, it would show up in the two detectors at the same time, exactly from the side, it's 10 milliseconds. If it comes in at an angle, it's gonna come at some fraction of that difference in timing. But the thing is that with only two detectors, you can't tell where on an annulus that source position is. And we can actually do just a little bit better than that by using um, some of the directionality of an individual detector. We can see that, it's in sort of, that our source is in sort of an ellipse, but this is a huge box compared with any kind of astronomical standard. You really need more detectors if you're gonna do a better job of localizing the source. So how can we do a better job? How will the instruments evolve? And what other kinds of sources might we be able to see? I've got to run through a series of slides here. At the present sensitivity, we have two detectors. We're at about a third of the sensitivity that we think advanced LIGO can do with some more tuning. We're tuning it right now, I assure you. Um, and we saw about one signal in about one month of observation. It was actually 16 days of live time because we were down half the time. 
And with that, we get a sky map that shows, yeah, it's somewhere in the sky. <laughs> um, we're starting a new run sometime probably in the fall where we hope to have three detectors. There's a sister um, endeavor in Italy um, named Virgo, um, very close to the Leaning Tower of Pisa where Galileo did a different, different and interesting experiment. Um, and here's a sky map for what we might expect then. Um, there are some places in the sky where we have actually very small error ellipses. We could say a source will be within that circle. There are lots of places where those ellipses are really quite huge. 2018, 2019, we'll continue to uh, tune our detectors. We should have our full sensitivity by then if things go according to plan. And by then, we'll be seeing something like one signal per day because of this wonderful increase in the number of sources in our reach as we get better reach. And you can see some of these error ellipses have gotten somewhat smaller. The next big step forward is when we add some more detectors. There are detectors in India and Japan which are in planning or in, in construction, and we think by 2022 they can be in operation. So making five detectors does a remarkable job of cleaning up this localization map, and at that point we can really start talking with astronomers and say, we think there's something here, you should go take a look at it, and this time you should believe us that it's there. This is roughly what it looks like on a map. Um, this is the, the full collection of the two American detectors, the Advanced Virgo detector, the Kagoho Japanese detector, and then LIGO India in, uh, in, in India, location, pardon me, to be determined. We're surrounded by the LIGO scientific collaboration, about 1,000 persons, 90 institutions, 16 countries. There's also a collaboration around Virgo, which we all work together to build the instruments and analyze the data. And by the way, we're not at all in competition with any of the other groups, Virgo and so forth. We're all working together toward the same goal because we all see how much more science you can get out if you put all the instruments together. So here's an idea of one way of opening a window on the universe, one with which you folks are all extremely familiar. And then here's another one. This is what happens if you sit in this new kind of observatory and start looking up at the skies to see what might be there. So what kinds of things might we see there? One possibility are colliding, colliding neutron stars. Neutron stars are interesting things. Um, they're stars which have collapsed, but not all the way down to a black hole. They, they didn't have enough mass to collapse all the way down. So their mass density is only such that a teaspoon weighs 10 million tons. They're not yet to infinite density. So if you collide two of those together, you'll get a signal which, especially if it's a binary, would look a bit like a gravitational wave from a black hole binary, but will carry information also about the internal dynamics of these neutron stars, which are much more complicated devices than black holes. We could expect to see maybe a supernova. They're pretty rare, and they have to be pretty close by for us to see. Um, there's no doubt going to be cosmic noise due to just lots and lots of gravitational wave sources going off um, simultaneously. Um, but maybe we could even reach down and see the primordial um, gravitational waves, just like the Big Bang microwave background. There's also a gravitational wave ba background. And then spinning neutron stars. This is something that we already know about from radio astronomy. There have been beautiful experiments done by using these as clocks, by seeing the beacon that sweeps around. If there's a little physical deformity on the side of, the neut of that neutron star, that could lead to a gravitational wave signal. And we can, might be able to observe the two at the same time, the radio signal and the gravitational wave signal. That'd be really exciting. So that leads me to this slide, which is where we, we really do hope that we can move to our multi-messenger astronomy. This is where we take our signals from gravitational waves, and we share them with all kinds of other observatories. We're currently working with something like 60 observatories, even at this early stage, to be, try and have this holy grail of putting simultaneously gravitational information together with electromagnetic information. We could learn some things that would be just astonishing if we could see both sources at the same time for the same signal. But I think surprises. This is what's always happened whenever we open a new window of the universe. Ask G Galileo if he thought he'd see more than some details of the moon. Did he think that he would see quasars and, uh, and who knows what? Of course not. And we don't know what to expect from gravitational waves. But I'll bet you there'll be some fun surprises coming up in the coming years. What kinds of future improvements could we make? We want to fully exploit the instrument that we designed. Um, that's something that will take a bit of time because we have some other upgrades that we want to make. We think we'll probably keep them busy until, oh, it's late in the 2020s or something like that. But at that point, we might want to start thinking about, again, asking the taxpayers if this is an interesting enough field to make another big step, which would mean probably making longer arms. If we can go from four kilometers to 40 kilometers, we'd have a 10 times bigger signal. We'd have another 10,000 um, different kinds of, of, of sources that we could take a look at. 
We might want to put it underground because there are some noise sources which are just irreducible on the, on the Earth's surface uh, due to the new, good old-fashioned Newtonian gravity. It's Newton getting his revenge, perhaps. Um, and then we'd probably like to have a couple of these scattered around the Earth. So we might ask the US taxpayers to help us with one, and we hope that those others will also spring up. The other thing that's really exciting is the notion of going into space. The Laser, laser Interferometer Space Antenna, or LISA, is a joint ESA-NASA project that's been under study for quite some time and has gone through some ups and downs. Um, the idea there is that once you get into space, which is not expensive or easy, vacuum, long arms, it's a really easy thing to come by. And so there you'd think about making an interferometer that's not you know, tens or, or hundreds of kilometers long, maybe, maybe 10 million kilometers long. And that first off boosts the signal up enormously for a lot of signals that are in the right wavelength range. It also tends to shift the attention from high frequencies down to low frequencies from the kind of masses we're looking at now, some tens of solar masses to tens of thousands or 10 to the six solar masses. And in that way, you could start to look at the gravitational wave signals from galaxies slowly crashing into each other and twirling around. So they, it's, it's a, a really interesting idea, and it's one which is an analogous to adding radio astronomy to optical astronomy. It's, of course, more signals, different signals, additional observatories, and different science that you can extract. So it would be a really wonderful thing to do that. Um, it's a, an expensive and complicated thing to do. That's the biggest problem. I'm going to show you here a nice simulation that was put together um, a while ago, as you'll see from some dates that show up, of what it'd be like to deploy a gravitational wave antenna in space. And here we see that um, a launcher has brought three more or less identical spacecraft up. Um, and we're now going to push them off into an interesting orbit, which is trailing the Earth in a place where you can stably have um, a set of of three um, satellites which will maintain their configuration without active station keeping. Um, there we go. Um, and so what you see here are three satellites with laser ranging between them. It's a somewhat different technique than what we do on the Earth, but it's still a way of using lasers to measure precise distances between those three satellites. By making sums and differences of the, of the lengths of that interferometer, you can look at different polarizations. And the fact that it sweeps out the sky in that very beautiful way through its orbit means that you look at a lot of the sky in a lot of different positions with that one installation. So that would be a one very, very beautiful experiment to do. The current launch date um, for, for the ESA-led program that's in motion is 2034. Um, I'm, I'm looking around for young candidates to uh, get excited about that. Um, and what we're also trying to do is to use the success of LIGO to encourage NASA to think about moving this earlier. So um, like your earlier speaker, I'll ask you if you ever run into a, a NASA administrator or a congressperson and they're asking what would be interesting to do in space, you can tell them detect gravitational waves. This is the ultimate gravitational wave detector. You can do things here you just can't think of doing on the Earth. So that's the end of my little story from 1.3 billion light years ago when these two black holes uh, met their, their death or moved on to the next phase or whatever you want to say, through the medium of, of Albert Einstein. I love this photograph. It just looks like he knew exactly how this was going to happen. <laughs> to the, the arrival at just the right moment, two days after we turned them on, at our detectors to make this magnificent signal. That's our discovery of gravitational waves and the observation of two black holes. Thank you very much.
The telescope has revolutionized the human experience countless times since its creation some 400 years ago. Celestron is doing our part to continue the evolution of the telescope and expand the horizons of the human mind. For decades, Celestron has been committed to providing individuals with high-quality telescopes and optical instruments at affordable prices. We strive to clear the way for intellectually curious people around the globe to experience and explore deeper into nature and the cosmos. When I think of Celestron, I automatically think of the people. Um, to me, a company is people. We have people that are passionate about what they do, and we have extremely talented individuals that work for this company. And I think it takes those, um, those intangibles to create great product. Founded in 1960 in Los Angeles, California, Celestron has been an industry leader in telescopes for over 50 years. As the world's largest telescope brand, we continue to develop technological innovations that set the pace of the industry. Celestron is synonymous with inspired design and state-of-the-art technologies. As an industry leader, we strive to remain the world's most innovative telescope brand. As a rapidly growing outdoors company, Celestron focuses on products that enhance the exploration of the great outdoors. As a champion of STEM education and the arts, we pursue the advancement of public scientific understanding. Our long-standing track record supporting astronomy, education, and outdoor-related nonprofits across the globe speaks to the values we hold dear. Celestron is committed to encouraging the exploration of our natural world in fun and unique ways. There's like a lifetime of good memories at Celestron. It's probably one of our star parties. I'd say probably at the Badlands when we had in the middle of nowhere a crowd of hundreds of kids coming off of school buses, coming up and observing the sun for the very first time through a telescope. I've had so many amazing experiences here at Celestron, from helping assist with the setup of equipment with Stephen Hawking, to the very humbling experience of a standing ovation after we announced to teachers at the National Science Teacher Convention that we were donating the binoculars to them. One that definitely stands out as a uh as kind of an achievement in my career was when we launched the SIVO telescopes, the Celestron Evolution. That was a really proud moment for me to be able to look at the people that I've essentially had grown up with and spent my career and be sort of at the pinnacle of achievement and be able to sort of unveil that and communicate that to, to all these people that I've, I highly respect and have worked with a, a long time. One of the things that makes a company great is great employees. We just strive to push the envelope to really accommodate the needs of our customers. Those are the keys to what drives Celestron and what makes us successful. Our goal is to inspire a sense of wonder, curiosity, and fun in our communities and throughout our company. We desire to be a vehicle that helps drive humanity's insatiable desire to know the universe. My vision for Celestron would be taking all those qualities, the the companies built upon and taking them into the future, into the next generation. And so we need to be continually evolving as a company. As someone that's been in this industry a long time, I do think that Celestron's best days are now and the even better days lie right ahead of us. We dedicate our work to opening the eyes of the people around the world and enhancing their view of the cosmos into the past and on to the future.